Good afternoon, good evening, and good morning. I am Pablo Protopapas. I'm the Scientific Program Director for ICS. So today is my pleasure to introduce my colleague and co-instructor, Chris Tanner, who is a lecturer at ICS. Uh, Chris completed his PhD from Brown University in Computer Science in 2019. And before that, he graduated from Florida Tech. Then he worked at the Department of Defense. He did a master's in UCLA, and then he worked at the MIT, MIT Lincoln Lab. And in between, Chris has done quite a lot of uh, interesting internships, uh, Spotify, IBM, and other very interesting internships. Uh, his research lies within NLP, specific, specifically discourse and semantics. Uh, he, the theme is persistent during his research is better understand within any body of text what is being said, what exactly is happening, and who is who. Uh, current projects concerns entity linking knowledge graphs, and he's doing translation for the American science language, sign language, and co-reference resolution. That's another thing he's very interested in. I feel we're very lucky to have Chris at ICS. Uh, say that he's an excellent teacher and an excellent mentor who cares deeply about the learning and the well-being of the students as a co-instructor and as a colleague I have experienced that a lot. He's always interested in collaborating and all, particularly mentoring students to tackle new exciting projects. If you're interested I'm sure he, you can talk to him. Uh, today his talk is a hard NLP task. Uh, he's going to tell us who is who and what is what? I'm looking forward to that. Uh, Chris, the floor is yours. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Pavlos. Appreciate the kind words. And uh, thank you all for being here. So uh, regardless of if you're part of the Harvard network or if you're outside of the Harvard network, uh, or if you do work with machine learning and NLP, or if you don't, thank you all for being here. I want everybody to feel welcomed and encouraged to ask questions along the way. My goal or my goals for today are to provide a glimpse into some of the state-of-the-art research within NLP, so natural language processing, to understand some of the most challenging tasks. I want you to be able to think you know, critically about your own machine learning approaches, and I want you to feel inspired to get involved with NLP if you're not already. So here's the outline for today. I'll briefly talk about NLP at large. The chunk of today's talk will be co-ref resolution. That is the who is who and what is what. And then I'll touch a little bit on improvements. So very early research steps in a few different directions, and then I'll conclude. All right, so let's jump into it. Clearly, our world is flooded uh, with text. Our digital world just has so much text. We have billions of web pages, billions of tweets, billions of people on Facebook and other social media platforms, and it's mostly text. We have a lot of video too, but how do we make sense of this text? How do we use it? How do we leverage it? Well, that is the entire focus of NLP. But it's not so easy, so language is funny. Here are a few brief examples. I don't have time to go through all of them. But you can see that on a literal, like if we were to literally take each of these sentences at, at face value, it doesn't really make sense. Right? Red tape holds up the new bridges, holds up new bridges. Clearly, red tape is not physically holding up bridges. Um, hospitals are sued by seven-foot doctors. They are not very tall doctors in this situation. Uh, if we skip down to Tesla crashed today, are we talking about the person? Are we talking about the stock? Are we talking about a car um, or a president running again versus the greatest marathoner of all time running again? Uh, she made him duck. So did she do a nice thing and prepare a meal for somebody? Or uh, did she throw something at, at this guy? We look at more examples. And I have not yet defined what co-ref is, um, but these are some slight co-ref examples. Maria likes May. What is May? Are we talking about the month? Are we talking about a person named May? If we see Maria likes May and Joe, we're like, oh, probably a person. Maria likes May and June, probably a month. If May likes Maria, May is probably a person. Doesn't really make sense for a month to like a person. And there are the situations like this, Maria hit May, then she fell, or you could use the word ran. And depending on how this sentence ends, like we immediately know who she is referring to, like we as humans, we don't have to think about it, but the entire meaning of this sentence is hinged upon this last word, 
we can, you know, like I said, just pretty much immediately know what's going on. So language is special and complex. It is a distinctly human ability. It was paramount to our evolution in terms of communicating with one another. As you can see on the last few slides, it's influenced by many social constructs, just kind of this world knowledge that we know about. It's very nuanced. You can just change one little word and the entire meaning changes. Uh, and it evolves over time. I can't keep up with the modern day slang. Uh, yeah, I'm not really trying to, but it's, I can't keep up with it. So NLP is different than linguistics, but there's some similarities. And regardless, if you were to look at the kind of linguistic structure of human language, um, here are different categories. So on the very bottom, we have the most surface level, um, shallow representations. So I'm gonna switch back and forth between two slides. So this gives a brief definition of each of the categories of ling linguistic structure. And this shows kind of a pictorial representation. It's not worth memorizing these things. Um, I'll get to the point in a second, but basically the very bottom layer characters are just the subunit, the smallest level of representation that we have. And as we go up to morphology, we're starting to combine these small characters into meaning a little bit. So it's how words are formed. But lexemes are the smallest unit that actually has meaning. So words within the human language. And then syntax is starting to look at the structure of language. So what are the rules that govern how language is formed? Semantics, as you might know, is the meaning of it. What are you trying to communicate? And if we jump all the way up to the apex here, discourse, that is kind of like the holy grail, the process that underlines language to really know what is being said. So right here is just a cartoon example that I made up in terms of its representation. Like this is a made up symbolic representation. I'm just trying to illustrate here that there exists some ever elusive constructs of language that we wish to capture. Uh, NLP these days um, doesn't really try to capture such symbolic representations. Instead, we use statistical machine learning to try to find patterns to approximate this well enough. All right, we approximate it according to some task, according to some metric, um, but discourse is kind of like the holy grail. This is the thing that we really wish that we could understand with language. And co-ref resolution falls within this category of discourse. Okay, so despite language being very tricky and nuanced and having you know, all these properties that I just said, we have clearly made significant strides like as a field. Um, as apparent by these real world applications that we see. So we have Google Translate, we have voice assistants, we have powerful search engines, and we have autocomplete, which sometimes is, is not that good, but like day to day, we interact with these things. So how is that possible? And ideally, operating with any of these real world things, it does uh, kind of capture, it has like ability to do discourse and semantics, you know, ideally, we hope that it truly understands the meaning of what we're trying to tell it, and that it understands all the complexities that could interweave between um, kind of a conversation, all right? That would be a great example of discourse. Okay. NLP, when we try to solve different things, we mostly address it from a task-driven standpoint. So here's just a, a list of a bunch of different tasks within NLP, and I, I group them by kind of the linguistic hierarchy that I already showed, right? So syntax was one of them, semantics was one of them. And under discourse here, we have co-ref resolution. You might recognize some other ones that um, you're familiar with, such as machine translation over here. So that was a short overview of NLP. All right, but we're focused on co-ref resolution. So I'll talk about what it is, why it's important, and I'll briefly touch on uh, how people do it at a high level. All right, so if we as a human were to pick a random news article, such as this one, I grabbed it from the New York Times. As we read it left to right, we build up a mental model of what's going on. So when we reach the word mammoth barge, so let's read this sentence together. In the end, a full moon seceded where puny machines could not, wrenching the mammoth barge out of the Egyptian mud, blah, blah, blah. So if I were to read this, like, yeah, I don't know what mammoth barge is yet. Like, it, I don't think it's referring to anything. 
And that's okay. It's clearly some important object. So I'm just going to stash it away in my brain. Uh, I'm, the color here doesn't mean anything. I'm just coloring it for aesthetics to indicate that it is clearly some object, some entity that we probably care about. Again, this is from the perspective of a human right now. And when we continued and we see Egyptian mud, this also appears like some important thing, an important entity. Uh, and it's probably distinct from mammoth barge. It's not the same thing. So I'm gonna color this with a different color to represent that, that it's a different thing. And then as we continue to read and we see the word it, if we're actually reading the sentence, wrenching the mammoth barge out of the Egyptian mud in which it became wedged six days earlier, reading this, we would immediately know that it's referring to the mammoth barge. It doesn't make sense that it's talking about mud and it's not a new concept. It is a pronoun. It's one of these previous things. It's clearly mammoth barge. And as we continue on, springtide finally set the ever given and its enormous stack, blah, blah, blah. We would know, oh yeah, it's the same thing. It's that barge that we just read about. And then likewise with the pronoun. And this is how we read, you know. Uh, I'm not trying to get into the complexities of like so much of how our brain operates when we're reading. I just meant to say, we don't have to think about this. We immediately know what we're talking about as we're reading. And when we see Egyptians down here, it's, it has some similar characters to this Egyptian mud, but this is talking about mud. This is not talking about mud. This is clearly talking about people who live in Egypt. So it's a different thing, once again, represented by a different color. So in our mind, we have implicitly and usually very immediately resolved which words are all referring to the same underlying thing. And this is exactly what co-ref resolution is. So I'm deliberately being a bit abstract and vague by using the word thing, uh, but I'll, I'll expand upon the different options of what a thing can be. So I assert that this is easy for humans. We do this without thinking, and rarely do we need to clarify and ask somebody when they're talking or when we're reading or anything like, uh, when you said he, uh, were you referring to person A or person B? Uh, you know, we just, we get it. Um, this, is, it's a, this is part of the being distinctly human. But if we're to take that same news article and we we're to throw it at one of the state-of-the-art models for co-ref resolution, uh, and this model uh, mentioned right here is, uh, yeah, it's been, it's been incredibly influential. Uh, it's a great model, but if we're to give it this document, it wrongly thinks that Mammoth Barge and Ever Given are two different things. It correctly resolved that this pronoun, it, refers to Mammoth Barge and that it refers to Ever Given, but it doesn't realize that these are the same thing. So this is bad because it means it's not able to leverage this shared information. So you can imagine like a search engine, if you're Googling something, um, it doesn't like, it's not able to use anything that would be related to Mammoth Barge. If you're doing like some information extraction type process. So I'm asserting that it is hard for computers. Uh, trust me, it is hard for computers, but you know, this is one example of how it fails. And within NLP, we've seen significant progress over the past five years, especially largely due to deep learning. But CoREF resolution is one of the tasks where we have not really seen significant progress. We've continued to see progress. It's been very incremental, um, but nothing like some of the other tasks where there's just like this profound leap where it gets to a threshold of like, oh yeah, we can use this as humans now. So the, the previous example was just on one document, but you can imagine that uh, it's actually important to be able to operate across multiple documents, tons of documents. And for it to be able to link together every single instance, every single mention of a word that is all referring to the same underlying thing. Like that's what we actually want CoREF resolution to do. So here's just a, an illustration of what that would look like. So same article from the New York Times. Here's one from AP News. And container ship, you know, right? Because we can represent the same concept in tons of different ways. So here, the entity container ship is actually referring to the same underlying concept of ever given and mammoth barge again. So that's why I'm coloring them here as the same colors. Whereas experts, this is a new concept, it's purple, uh, Suez Canal, it's green. But we would love to have a system that can do something like this. And that is what all of CoREF models, computer models try to do. 
So in those examples, I only showed entities. An entity is a person, location, organization. You can imagine that it's also critical to be able to do so for events. So actions, you know, verbs that can take place. Something sparked or exploded, somebody snowboarding, uh, a wrench, like fixing something or doing somersaults. Excuse me. So here, same exact two documents. I'm just illustrating events with these little squiggly boxes. So all of the other um, entities are here, but now events are also here. So ideally, we want to do entity coref and event coref. Um, for the most part, these fields are completely distinct, though. People work on one or the other. There have been there's very little research where people are trying to do both. Um, it is one of my interests, though, and some master's thesis students are working with me on it also. So yeah, here are same exact thing. I just took away all the words that are not entities or events just to make it easier to see. And at the end of the day, though, we're ultimately clustering them. So coref is a clustering task. This is what we're concerned about. How well can we cluster these mentions? So the takeaway number one is that coref resolution determines which mentions all refer to the same underlying entity or event, and it's ultimately a clustering task. So when we're measuring the performance of our system, we're measuring it on a cluster, like based on its clusters. All right, so that's what it is. Why do we care about this? So hopefully it's already been properly motivated. You know, you can see that it's useful for many downstream tasks. It truly is trying to answer the who is who and what is what. And to get more concrete with some of the NLP tasks that it can help with, even 20 years ago, people identified how useful it can be for things like information extraction. So search engines, uh, question answering, so interacting with the voice assistant or document summarization. So you have a bunch of documents. How do you summarize it into something that's meaningful, but way more succinct? All right, so how does it work? Uh, this is kind of like extra credit knowledge. I'm going to go into some of the nitty gritties of, of different systems. Um, but if you zoom out, we know that for coref resolution, we always want the input to be a corpus, a set of documents, raw text. And we want the output to be clusters, right? Or each cluster is um, a set of mentions that all refer to the same thing. But here in the center, this is the magic part. This is where our coref uh, model goes. And pretty much every system has these three components. I'll briefly walk through each of these now. So mention detection is first determining what are we even trying to do? Like, where are these mentions? Where are these entities and events? We don't get them for free. Uh, we need to first identify what are the entities, where, what are the events. So mammoth barge, Egyptian mud, it, just locating these things first. So uh, the past slide was for entities. This is for events. I listed it right down here. Or you could imagine doing it for both. So these mentions, they, they are, to be very concrete, they are spans of text, spans of contiguous text. Uh, technically, it doesn't have to be contiguous. You could uh, have an action like you can split an infinitive. So you could have, uh, you know, like two and then some modifiers in between and have another word after. But for the most part, like 99% of them are contiguous spans of text. So that's a quick um, description of what mention detection is. So now that we have these mentions, then the, the gold part of our system, like the, where all the magic happens, is being able to determine how similar all these mentions are from one another. So pretty much every model does a mention pair model. Technically, there's also something called a mention ranking model and things like that. But effectively, every system is in the business of trying to say, hey, I have one mention and I want to know what is the likelihood that I'm referring to any other particular mention. So you can imagine this as being a fully connected graph just to make it uh, legible. I only showed six mentions here. So you have some score that your model is trying to produce that tells you how similar each possible pair is. So now that we have done the, 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 the hard part, the magic part of the CoRef system, the next st step, the, the final step is clustering them. So imagine that we had this fully connected graph. We know the scores for everything. We need to come up with some threshold, some way to cluster these things and to say, all right, if everything is above this threshold or below this threshold, let's cut it off and say that that thing is a cluster. The uh, wild thing, so I illustrated that with, with this, uh, things that, well, it looks like the, the lowest value is 0.67. So 
somewhere around there was the cutoff point. And you can say that, hey, anything that is still connected, everything that has a value that's above that threshold, let's say that's a cluster, anything below it is not a cluster. The wild thing is that almost all research still uses agglomerative clustering for this. Um, there are weaknesses of using agglomerative clustering. Um, I've done some work on uh, throwing other considerations into it of like how big your cluster is. Let's look at kind of more global shared properties. And there is some work on it, but for the most part, even state-of-the-art systems are still doing agglomerative clustering. Uh, so there's a lot of good work that I think still lies ahead by coming up with smarter ways to come up with this cluster level of representation. But it's not a trivial task. It's, um, it's pretty difficult to imagine how, how you can do so in a sound way, hence why there's been little progress on this in 20 years. So those are the three components, very high level overview. That's kind of extra credit knowledge of how these things work. But now let's jump into some of the findings over the years, things that, that make this a challenging yet fun task to work on and some of the work that I've been interested into. So in 2010, there's a system from Stanford called uh, multi, Multipass Sieve, Civ, I mean, uh, listed down here. And it essentially was just rules. It was handmade manual rules. And these rules were really effective <laughs> and it had state of the art. It beat everybody else. It was, it was like a shared task at a workshop. It did very well, and even to this day, it is a strong baseline to consider. And this is for entity coref, which I'm denoting up here in the blue. And uh, the metric that people use is a combination of a few different cluster-based metrics. You effectively take the average of all those, and you come up with your final score called the Connell F1 score. So this had a Connell F1 score of 58.3 on a particular data set. So, the rules that I just showed on the previous slide are listed here, and I only touch on two of them just to uh, show what they actually are. So like the rule number one, um, cluster together all, or actually this was uh, number three. I wrongly wrote one, I meant three. Rule number three is you cluster together all entity dimensions that are identical. So you start off with very high precision uh, rules. And as you're going down your list of rules, it's getting a little more sloppy. It's getting a little more relaxed. You can imagine this not being perfect though, just because two things have the same exact characters doesn't mean that they're actually the same thing, right? Apple it could be a fruit, it could be a company, it could be somebody's last name. Bank, it could be uh, like a financial institute or it could be uh, like a river bank. But surprisingly, these 13 rules were, like I said, very effective and it's a very strong baseline. And it was kind of like depressingly so. It's like somebody, I mean, it, it definitely took work to come up with these rules. Um, but I illustrate this work to show just how much you can get in terms of performance by thinking critically of like, how do we incorporate this kind of real world knowledge, real world knowledge, such as rule number 10, Wikipedia. So the rule was, if one of the mentions is an alias of the other mention, you say, yes, they should form a cluster. Um, so within this rule-based system, it is truly unsupervised and you're forming your clusters as you work down the list. There is no threshold. There is no uh, probability of any two mentions, things like that. Um, so within this Wikipedia article, we see uh, Donald Glover, the awesome Donald Glover. And then he also goes by Childish Gambino, his rap name. So we would know that these are the same, denoted here by having the same colors, whereas Atlanta, different concept. It is this TV show. So it's a different color. Hey, Chris, there is one question from Rashmi. Um, you want to read the motion? Yeah, yeah, I got it, thanks. Um, so Rashmi asked, how do you pick entities plus events? Um, I'm not sure what the question is. Like, how do we find these? Oh, oh, so I see. Your question is like, how do the mention detection systems work? So uh, something I didn't say is that for the most part, people within the CoverF world, don't even address this. And they just say, we're going to use some pre-existing uh, model that works for mention detection in part because like mention detection is kind of its own line of, of research. Um, but I can answer that uh, the, like in this rule-based system that I just presented, it has a rule for that. So it can define entities uh, with its own uh, sieve, but modern approaches, they use, uh, uh, they use BERT. So SpanBERT is the, the latest, greatest state of the art. For those who don't know what BERT is, I'll briefly touch on it a little bit later. Um, but you can imagine 
any system that has some contextualized representation of text. So you can use like an RNN or an LSTM or old school before then you CRFs or HMMs, anything that has this kind of uh, this, this concept of, of, of history, this contextual information um, is a strong candidate for a system that could determine where the mentions are. It's like a sequence labeling task. Uh, Charles asked, as humans, we make, oh, this is a long question. We are being limited by lack of it to draw from. What are the most advanced in terms of context importing? So I skimmed that question. I think I understand it. I think I understand it. Um, yeah, so, so that's a great question, Charles. And that's kind of the, at the crux of all of this work that I'm trying to present here. Why? So whereby I'm showing that in the old days, we had these kind of manually defined, let's use this external data, but that's kind of kludgy. So I'm like really uh, skipping ahead by, by answering this question now and saying that, um, but in modern day, we, we like to stay away from having to manually define these features. Uh, so a lot of work is kind of dismissed, let's use external stuff, but we're kind of coming back around to it. So there is no great solution yet. There is no obvious way to go about incorporating this information. Stuff that I'm researching and trying to use is uh, common sense reasoning. There exist these data sets that try to, it's almost like the old school ways I was showing you, but this like fake symbolic representation, you can try to capture common sense. Um, so you have these data sets, like I said, that, that uh, represent world knowledge. So this is a, uh, a very unexplored area that, that um, I'm working with with somebody else. What is the math behind the scores? Is TFIDF for cosine similarity? Um, yeah, that's a great question, uh, Krishna. So the, the, mention, uh, the mention pair model in the beginning, uh, like in the middle, I mean, that, that produced the scores, that is where all the magic happens. So I can't quickly answer like what happens behind it because that's truly like an entire model but I will go through some of those models. So I can't quickly answer it, but you'll see how different systems um, come up with those scores. But yeah, it's a great question. Do modern spe speech recognition systems like Alexa wait until the human is done speaking for attempting co -ref? Yeah, so Aaron asked that question and uh, yeah, they, they wait until everything is said, but I don't know if any of those systems actually take in co -ref resolution. I, in some ways, I kind of doubt that they do. Um, just because the state of the art is not that good is why I'm skeptical that it's actually included. But I listed them as motivating examples because ideally they should be. Yeah, great questions. All right, so that was a rule-based system. Next step is, uh, oh dear. The fact that uh, many systems then try to say, oh, I don't wanna manually um, write these rules. I want my machine learning model to figure them out. I mean, figure out how to use them. So systems for years would still manually define these features. It's up to the machine learning model to figure out how to incorporate them, how to weight them. And what we see is the Connell F1 score, it increased, but it's not like it was significant. And this work isn't like ancient, you know, like some of the first models in 2011, but even like 2015, which according to me, wasn't, wasn't too long ago. Um, we were struggling to figure out how to use deep learning period for CoREF. So pretty much 65 was, very hard to beat. It was state of the art um, up until like 2015. So takeaway number two is that research um, has larger, largely relied on machine learning models with manually defined features. It gave strong results, but clearly that's a limitation. Like we don't want to stay in this business of having to come up with like a hundred rules. Truly, some of these would have tons of rules. I'm going to switch back a little bit, like defining what is the distance between any two mentions that you're considering? What is the speaker? What is the gender of the speaker? Um, a bunch of them are listed back here too. Um, all right, that's, that's not where the field is progressing. If we switch over to event coref, well, ECB plus is the premier corpus. It's a little shy of a thousand documents. And the whole thing is trying to do event coref. So checked into and checked into, uh, should coref, they're both talking about Lindsay Lohan. And if you do a very simple baseline, like a depressingly uh, easy baseline of just saying, if it's the same lemma or not. So for any word, you can look at the limitized form of the word. So it's just the base form. So as an example, running becomes run, ran becomes run. And if you simply say, I'm gonna limitize all of my events, right? Say you've already determined where the mentions, where the mentions are, and you say, I'm just gonna limitize everything. And if they go to the same lemma, I'm gonna say they co-ref. So you can imagine like this shouldn't work well, 
because we overload verbs all the time. It's an overloaded vocabulary. You know, many things can check into, you know, or you could have a verb like run, many things could run. But in this corpus, if you just say, if they, if they have the same limit, let's say they co-ref, it is strikingly high. It is a strong baseline and it should not be that way. Um, so it is hard to show any uh, new strong results on this premier data set that we have for event co-ref. But I worked hard on this for years uh, and, and I was very much interested in how can we use very few features, like way fewer than the entity stuff that I was just showing that still had like a hundred features being thrown at it. Well, my key insight was, and this was, um, you know, fairly obvious to everybody within the field as we're starting to move towards deep learning in 2000, well, 13 to 2017, we're all making this shift. It was like, yeah, we should probably be looking at contextualized word embeddings based on the context. Let's have some representation of every single word. And it's the comparison of these embeddings, these comparisons of the vectors that we should be concerned with. So this is very hand wavy, but I had some great results showing if you, so here are two different mentions. One is wedged, one is stuck. I illustrated them in red. If you take some words before it, some words after it, and you throw it into a CNN, uh, I used a conjoined CNN with contrastive loss. Uh, so it's symmetric in terms, it's, it's all shared weights. You just have essentially the same CNN and it's just getting very good at determining if these two mentions are the same thing or not. It's saying, are they identical? Yes or no. It gives you a score in between there. And I deliberately tried to use very few features. So I took only, I considered five features that um, seemed to be highly effective for past work. There's a lot going on in this table, but the main takeaway is, hey, the numbers are higher than all the previous numbers. So I was able to achieve a 70.4, uh, which improved over say a 57.7, which was that depressingly high baseline. Like it ought to be higher. And a lot of, it's like, this was kind of the ceiling though. Like, you know, tried for years and even getting above 57 was quite difficult. Um, to show how the, show some of the tricky examples, some false positives, like, yeah, these things are getting listed as being co-ref, but they're clearly not co-ref when it's talking about Obama, when it's about um, Sony, so it makes mistakes, false negatives. Like, look how hard this would be. Like, how are you gonna capture that like, this kind of human level colloquial phrasing of things. These should all refer to the same underlying thing. It's about somebody accepting, you know, getting hired to play some role, some acting role. So the casting of Smith or Smith stepped into the role or Smith was handed the keys to play, you know, whatever character. There is no way my model could, could learn this and models still uh, struggle very much to, to do so. It also missed things like the, the bombs fell and the aerial bombing of because fell and bombing, these words don't look the same. So yeah, towards um, Charles's question earlier, if we could use some kind of context, like world knowledge, it would probably help us in this way. But the, one of the main punchlines of all this work is that it's hard to come up with how do you incorporate this world knowledge that's not a kludgy um, kind of makeshift way. So one of the findings that, that I'm trying to show here is that state of the art uh, for that this yielded state of the art uh, results for event coref, ref um, And the two features that gave us all of the great results were uh, character embeddings and lemma embeddings. So you can have some vector representation of the lemma and then also some character representation. And both of these are learned based on the context too. And again, we were using a CNN that could look at these window of words. Um, but like, this is kind of surprisingly easy. And, and although it was exciting to have, you know, the, the best performing system in the world on this thing, it was a bit unsatisfying because it's like, this ought to not perform so well. So it was clear that we need a better corpus. Like we, as a community, we need a better corpus and other researchers who work in this space have all agreed. It is difficult to come up with a better corpus though. Imagine how manually intensive it is having to read multiple documents a thousand documents and truly annotate across all of these documents. Oh yeah, this word was the same thing as this word. You know, it's N squared possible combinations of documents that you have. I should also mention that that this corpus that I'm, I'm not insulting it. I'm glad that it exists. It is the best that we have. Uh, I said it was 982 documents. I should, I should have mentioned also that it was very short documents. We're talking like five sentences, sometimes 10 sentences, but usually somewhere around there. 
so takeaway number four is that event coref is especially hard. In many ways, it's harder than entity coref, in part because the verbs, the actions, right, the events are overloaded, like I, like I showed. Um, many people can speak, many people can run. And how do you, how do you factor in this context? Um, sorry, I thought there was a, a question. Yeah, so those are the, the takeaways so far. And then this amazing, beautiful system came out in 2017 doing entity coref. It was an idea that me and probably many others have had too. It's, it's in terms of like, we ought to just be able to throw an entire document at it and have it learn everything, like learn exactly where the mentions are. It should be an end-to-end -end system. You know, its predictions of, of detection, detecting the mention should allow it to do a better job of determining what is coref and vice versa. If you had some indication that this mention is pretty bogus because it doesn't co-ref with stuff, then it's like, oh, maybe that's a bad mention to begin with. So having an end-to-end -end system would try to address the, uh, the problem that the fact that errors could cascade throughout a system. Charles just asked it in the chat. So as a better corpus, can you rip YouTube audio and speech re recognize with sample level video frame information? You CYC's data. I don't know what CYC's data is. Um, yeah, so I appreciate the uh, kind of clever ideas that you're coming up with. Um, the difficulty in this, though, is still that we, like, we don't get any annotation for free. Like, uh, and, you know, we would be getting text for free. But, like, how do we actually know what is the, you know, what is the grounded, unique entities or events that we're referring to? Um, that isn't to say that you can do very interesting research with, you um, it's a database in Texas starting in the 80s. Okay. Yeah, I'm unfamiliar with that. Um, but there is a lot of exciting research that is being done uh, combining audio and video. Um, for those who are unaware, uh, yeah, things like video bird, you can try to understand scenes. Like there's a lot of uh, interdisciplinary work that has really started to blossom over the past two years. <clears throat> but yeah, this first end to end system came about 2017. It's elegant, it's great, it's what we all wanted. Um, and it works for entity coref. People are now trying to apply it to event coref. This is only the first part of it. It's all stitched together as one network. I just didn't have room on the slide to show it. And this, this great model, which does not rely on someone else's mention detection, right? It does mention detection too. It used a bi-directional LSTM for those who are familiar with how they operate. Like that's great. This is what we had at the time. We did not have transformers yet. Like they came out in the same year, but um, yeah, this, elegant system was able to get a 68.8. And if you remember the uh, rule-based system that I mentioned, the multi-pass sieve, that was like 58, 50, yeah, 58, 57. So it's like, yeah, that's a, that's a big performance gap, but there's a world of difference between this elegant, amazing deep learning model and a rule-based system. Yeah, we're only seeing kind of 10 points. Um, and the entity coref data set that exists, um, it's bigger. Um, it's like 3,500 documents or so, and they're also very short documents. Um, so yeah, the bidirectional LSTM encodes rich information. Um, that's how I was able to get a lot of its, a lot of its gains. And this was the top part of the system. So like once you actually had the mentions represented in this format, it's ultimately making a, a classifier, a classifying uh, decision too, saying, are they, are they a mention or not? And then you can do clustering with it afterwards, like agglomerative clustering once again. Uh, Shruti just asked in the chat, and sorry if I mispronounced your name, can advanced attention mechanisms such as transformers help with co-ref? Exactly. It's a beautiful question. You're exactly right on track. Um, and I'm about to get to that, actually. So uh, one of the last things with this elegant model that I'm talking up, though, is that it still relied on some features, though. It wasn't like it was completely featureless. Uh, these were important features, which they've denoted here, uh, that were being piped in to uh, the, the span representation, the, the mentioned score, I mean. Yeah, so this part. So like this is, this is pretty much like what we all wanted. And uh, yeah, some of the remaining issues, though, is that it still conflates relatedness with equality. So like flight attendants and pilots, yeah, they're all used in similar context. But if you actually looked at the very nuanced aspects of how they're being used, it's like, oh yeah, they're being used in completely different ways. And once again, using world knowledge would, would be great. Um, in this example, it wrong, uh, things with the same color were, were classified as being the same, um, as being coref. 
So it thought that them was referring to ships, which is referring to the also they here. It's like, no, they're, they're not at all. Here we're talking about um, the people who need to be rescued versus the people who are doing the rescuing. Um, but just based on some context embeddings, like this is kind of the best we have, right? So kind of the, one of the main takeaways that I'm also trying to say is that just how, how complex and brittle the structure of language can be. So although it's great to have these rich contextual embeddings, um, it can be kind of easy to trick the system. Paraphrasing, uh, like Prince Charles and his wife, Camellia, and with royals, like how do you know that this is actually referring to the same thing as this? Like at most, you just have the context and hope that it can capture it. So to Shruti's very astute question, yeah, Bert is incredible, has made incredible progress ever since it was introduced in 2017. Uh, for, for those who haven't heard of Bert, it is single-handedly the biggest, most revolutionary uh, finding and, and model that has come about in the past four or five years. It already has over 19,000 citations, and it has yielded state-of-the-art results in pretty much every single task within NLP, including co-ref resolution. So at a very high level, because I could spend an entire two lectures uh, talking about what BERT is, I'll just say that you put in input, like, uh, like a document, you have these words, and what you're getting out is, well, it is trying to do some, you know, some task, but it's able to do some task because it is learning how to encode information very well. This is the magic behind it, is learning just how to encode these vector representations in an incredibly sophisticated way. And again, you can, you know, kind of pop off the top and determine what task you want to apply these to. And that is how BERT has had such phenomenal results. Everybody uh, runs BERT on some pre-existing, like all of the world's text. It very much learns how to create these rich, incredible embeddings. And then for whatever task you want, say, all right, well, I'm just going to fine tune that on my own task. You know, BERT has, has positioned itself so that it can do a good job of coming up with these embeddings that will be useful for my own task. So that fits in very nicely to this end-to-end -end system that I just mentioned. So instead of an LSTM, let's use a transformer. Everything else stays the same. And the F-score shoots up to 79. So that's awesome. Like we're, 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 That was a significant uh, jump. But it still has the same issues, like the same tricky cases that would trip up the other one. It gets some of them right. So some of the difficult ones are still super difficult. Uh, Charles asked in the chat, are there measures of how often humans are wrong in text interpretations? Yes, that's a great question. Uh, so inner annotator agreement is definitely a, a serious issue. And because it is so difficult to get people to annotate these things, period. I mean, you can spend hundreds of thousands of dollars getting linguists to annotate a thousand documents. Um, it's clear that I don't have the, the numbers off the top of my head, but it's clear that people disagree all the time. On, uh, on the annotations. Um, so yeah, that's a very valid point. Like there is always going to be a ceiling, no matter how amazing our data set is, just based on the fact that even humans disagree. I saw there was one other question too. Um, when will the way we write produce content now need a new aspect of meta writing better world knowledge for I'm not sure if the emphasis of your question, uh, Lou, I guess if that's a lowercase L, Lou asked. Um, I'm not sure if the emphasis of your sentence is now, like asserting that we write language differently than how we used to, uh, but it's a very valid point that you're asking. The, the, the way that we structure language, the way that we write stuff can drastically affect the performance of any co-ref system. And, um, and that's why it's also important to have more data sets for co-ref. Uh, I'm gonna speed up a little bit and just uh, say that, um, Let's see, what was the takeaway with the slide? So research has demonstrated that BERT can capture many complex linguistic properties. Oh yeah, but it's far from being solved. You know, so BERT um, just abstractly representing via a stronger color of yellow, what BERT and all of our other advanced models are really good at capturing. But discourse, we're still just kind of scratching the surface. It's far from being solved. You know, here are some failed examples, things like um, it thought that, uh, let's see, an incorrect missing. Wait, which one underline? Indicate incorrect. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it brought, this was a false positive. Uh, the BERT based model thought that marine life center and ocean theater should co ref. I mean, why not? They probably have similar embeddings, right? According to it, ocean and marine. But no, these are distinct 
concepts. Again, the same, the same example that the end-to-end -end system failed on in terms of royals and Prince Charles and his wife. It can't paraphrase this. It doesn't know how to do it. Um, so takeaway number five is that neural pre-trained text encoders, such as BERT, captures very rich information, but they still miss some nuanced cases. Um, and then another takeaway is that until we have better, better data, and this is what I'm, I, I just so strongly believe in and have seen from working on this for years, is that until we have, have better data, we don't really even know how great our past existing systems are. Like in some ways, they're probably doing a better job in some areas of CoREF than what we even realize, and definitely doing a worse job than what we realize in other categories. <clears throat> so I think the best use of our time is trying to develop better data sets. Otherwise, we're just kind of hammering away, throwing more and more complex models at something that seems to have kind of an asymptote in terms of performance. So. An insight I have is that instead of hammering away, this is pretty much what I just said, um, and this is kind of a, a take home for, for anybody who works within the machine learning space, is to always think very critically about your problem, about your data, to be very data driven. Look at the stuff, the data that you're going into the model, that you're putting into your model, and look at the data that is coming out of your model, i.e. your results. And, uh, you know, I've spent years on this problem, and you know, now looking back, it's like, oh, yeah, my time would have been better spent had I started with making a better data set. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, um, it's a pretty gigantic task to try to do, but we're doing so now. Uh, and then also how you frame the problem. So like, this is naturally a clustering task and we're doing so with pairwise predictions. There's been some great research. Uh, there's one paper that came out recently. It's like, oh, maybe we should be treating this as a question answering task. You can ask, who does this refer to? And uh, we might be able to leverage way better performance just on the way that we're structuring the problem. So that was how, and I'll briefly touch on some of our latest uh, new efforts in, in terms of improvements. So first, no data. Uh, what would we do if we had no data? So because that data sets are pretty lacking in terms of, yeah, there's like only 982 documents for event coref, it'd be great that we had, if we had some magical, amazing 10,000 document corpus, but in lieu of that, for real world stuff, excuse me, we have to, um, or it's worth looking into, how would we perform on a new data set without labels at all? So can we come up with a powerful unsupervised model? <clears throat> so uh, this is some, some joint work. Uh, I'm advising a master's thesis student at ETH Zurich. I'm co-advising him. And he has some very late breaking results that are promising, whereby we're, com we're combining two existing systems the manual rule-based system, the Stanford multi-civ approach, that is unsupervised, that approach. And then the state-of-the-art BERT-based model that I just mentioned is very supervised. Well, what about if we just use these unsupervised predictions as if they are gold labels? Like they are not gold labels. What about if we treated them as if they were? For, sorry, and to be clear, like for this system, and because we don't have you know, in this imagined scenario, we don't have gold labels for this new unknown data set, but we can simulate such is what I'm saying. So one concern though, is like, if that's our gold, if our gold is noisy labels, then wouldn't we be capped at our performance in terms of what we can predict? Like you would think at best, we're only going to be able to predict the noisy labels that we started with. So doing so in this manner is distant, it's called distant supervision. And uh, some of our latest results though, show that no, we can actually, get better performance than just the rule-based systems themselves. And that is the way, because of BERT, because it's in some ways you can kind of think of it as regularization and the way that we're using it. Um, BERT-based rich embeddings provide this kind of extra world knowledge because it has been trained, pre-trained on tons of data. So in theory, it's, it's, it, what it's doing is it's learning how to generalize beyond just the rules that we gave it. There's a lot going on in this graph. Uh, this is a very late breaking result that we have, but basically a blue line is better than the red line. Like that's the good thing. And, when, and it's good and it makes us happy that the green line is higher than the black line. So if we look at all of the Stanford rules, the 13 rule-based system uh, that is denoted here in black. So if we look, if that was what we threw into our BERT-based model as being you know, kind of the synthetic gold labels, uh, we were able to get to the green line, 
So that's why it's great that the green is better than the black. And likewise, if instead of using all the Stanford rules, if we only use three, the motivation for only using three as opposed to all of them is that maybe that's too precise. Like maybe we're um, kind of hurting ourselves by having all of the rules. Maybe if we scale back a little bit and be a little more general. And in fact, even the, Stan the original Stanford paper showed that if you use three rules, you're already getting something like 91 or 92% accuracy. Like, sorry, not 91 and 92% of the goodness of had you used all the rules. So you get a lot of a lot of the benefit from all the rules using only three. And even in that scenario, if we treated that those three rules as being the gold labels, we throw it into BERT. I mean, we throw that data into BERT, we're able to get a slight increase in performance. Um, so just looking at the chat. So as a reminder, uh, these are the two main data sets that people use for event and entity co-ref, you know, relatively small. I mean, this one isn't too, I mean, people, this is an enormous effort. They have richly annotated this corpus with tons of stuff. But what about if we want something better, bigger? So some of my latest work is, is involved with this. So how can we create the best data set period? So I'm collaborating with some people who uh, we are trying to come up with a collaborative system. So instead of just like one person has to annotate an entire document and it's only up to that one person, hopefully we get other people to annotate too. Let's make this almost like a, like a Google Doc style thing. And instead of forcing people to run it locally on their own machine, which is not conducive for collaboration, we're going to host it on this website that we have. Uh, it's in construction right now. You can start with many state-of-the-art models in the sense of, uh, you know, why not just run some of these amazing models to get its predictions as to where the mentions are and what the co-ref uh, chains are. And you can choose to kind of vet them or not. You say, oh, I approve, I approve, I approve, or I disapprove. And you can easily uh, look at any of the state-of-the-art models. Uh, we have a very clever idea, I think, in terms of how to quickly do the cross-document fact like the, I mean part of it the fact that uh, it is normally like an n squared process you know to keep in mind oh well any chain within this document I have to look at all the other n documents so we're addressing such by uh, throwing entity linking at it so um, entity linking for any given mention you're going to tie it to a real knowledge graph that exists in our situation we're tying it to Wikipedia so if you see a John Smith as long as you do the entity linking annotation of saying, oh, it's this Wikipedia, John Smith. Then whenever you encounter a different document, if you do the same linking, then that immediately resolves the co-ref, the cross-document co-ref for you. Like you don't have to once again, look through all your previous documents and say, oh yeah, 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 that is the one. You've already defined it by grounding it to Wikipedia. So just as a cartoon example, you know, you, this is, uh, and we do have a lot of this already implemented. But you can imagine uh, clicking any of these state-of-the-art models and saying, oh, suggest what the mentions ought to be, denoted here by the different underlines. And then if you actually click one of them, say, okay, well, but go ahead and annotate for me, say, Spacey, which is a great um, library, a great package with a bunch of different models included. We can say, oh, well, I'm just going to take Spacey's. Go ahead and annotate that for me. You can click on any of these and very, very quickly uh, choose to kind of approve or disapprove any of these annotations. Because events are usually verbs, um, you could click verb and it'll just immediately show you what are all the verbs here. Same thing with nouns when you're doing entity co-ref. Um, so this is what we're building and uh, we have uh, a lot of high hopes for it. So a few closing slides. I know we're almost strapped for time. This is just all the takeaways again. Um, co-ref determines which mentions all refer to the same underlying entity and event. It's ultimately a clustering task. Um, and we've been throwing many manually defined features at it without being able to properly use deep learning for quite some time. We need a better corpus. Uh, event coref is especially hard. Uh, contextualized representations work pretty well, hence why BERT works really well. But we don't fully understand how great our systems are, and we don't truly know what is possible. So, but there have been a lot of exciting advances over the past 10 years. Again, it's far from being solved, but I think it's one of the most challenging and exciting areas of NLP to work on. <clears throat> and a lot of credit goes to uh, my uh, collaborators and current students. So these are the students that I'm currently advising. Uh, the top row is students who are doing a uh, master's thesis with me, many of whom start next year and will finish next year on it. But you know, we've already been discussing their projects. A lot of these are on event co-ref and entity co-ref. 
Um, some students I advise at ETH Zurich and two amazing high school students working uh, with them on sign language classification. And then my collaborators are on other projects. So with that, I close, cutting it close on time there, um, but I'm happy to stick around as long as you guys have time to answer some of the questions that you have. <laughs> and, I, and I already see Charles asked an incredible question. Can you gamify the annotation tool? That is exactly our plan. That's the direction we're moving towards uh, in order to make it fun and to just stir up more interest in annotating. Because otherwise, who's going to annotate for us? Like, how, what, are we, what are we going to do? Pay hundreds of thousands of dollars for, for people to annotate? So if we could find um, a way to make it a fun game, which is our goal, um, that would help a lot. John asked, um, has there been much work on topic using data from languages besides English dialects? I think I understand the question. If you're, if you're asking, uh, I was confused by the word topic, uh, on the topic using. So if you're asking just uh, have people use non-English to do co-ref, um, I'll say that, yes, they have. And in general, NLP, uh, would greatly benefit from even more aggressively looking at languages other than English. People are aware of the fact that, that we need to do so. So we're moving in that direction. But specifically for CoREF resolution, uh, English is the most popular. Chinese is the second most popular. And there are data sets for Portuguese, Russian, Korean, and Japanese, um, all of which are pretty small. Oh. Uh, Dimitri or Dimitri um, asked, can frames be incorporated in context determination? What do you mean by frames here? What type of frames? Like some, some lexical frames or what are we talking about? So what I'm thinking about classical frame definition in AI, like Minsky definition of frames. Yeah, so as a, as a, <laughs> as a non-linguist, uh, I do not know much about frames at all. So if you can enlighten me on like how you see these things being used or like what you would hope to capture. Um, so the general answer, idea but... of frame uh, was essentially you can think about as an object in computer science. Mm -hmm. So you have a particular uh, thing, for example, chair, and you can say what chair could be used. Uh, so general idea was from decades back, what perhaps human thinks in terms of frames when you enter and see the kitchen, you sort of know what are the object in the kitchen, what is done in the kitchen, yep. and things like that. Yep. So uh, uh, I was guessing that that's what you meant. So yeah, that's a great question. And and uh, I think people have definitely tried using some of the manual rules for that 10 years ago in some of those rule-based systems, like literally, like, you know, yes or no properties of is this frame connected to this frame by some relation, things like that. And it's similar and like, yeah, so like there exists this, this data set called FrameNet. So that's the, the corpus that people use for that. And, and what you're getting at is very similar to something that I'm going to look at this summer um, of using common sense reasoning for CoREF. Uh, it's only similar to what you're saying in terms of trying to use this, this like real world representation of how things interact with one another. Um, but it, it's still, it's like, it's something to be explored. You know, other than coming up with these manual definitions of like, is so and so connected to so and so by this? You know, like we don't want to move in that direction. So what I was trying to say is that it's still, it's it's not obviously clear how to use them in a robust, rich way, so that any system and kind of like this deep learning manner can learn how to use this information, right? Like in a robust way. I'm, I'm kind of talking in circles here, but does that make sense? Yeah, it does make sense. To me, it's a very interesting topics which comes in AI many times and you sort of mentioned in your presentation, how to incorporate something like an expert system with more of neural net and sort of became partially sort of decision tree-like exactly. structure. Exactly. So, so, so I didn't explicitly state what I'm about to say, but you're hitting on the, the crux of kind of like where I was trying to take all this presentation in terms of saying, old school ways of having these rule-based real world knowledge stuff clearly has limitations. Fancy, hands-free is amazing, but clearly for a problem like discourse stuff, it's gonna reach a ceiling. So how do we merge these two? How do we marry these two together? Um, and I think that that is where we'll see some advances, that and just having better data sets and stuff like that. Um, so I don't have a good answer for that, but it's what I'm interested in.
Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Appreciate the question. Uh, Charles asked in the chat, are there languages that are better for CoRef than uh, based, based on their structure? Um, I don't know. The fact that so many people have worked on English CoRef, I'll say that the performance is, is the best for English, but that doesn't answer your question of kind of like, are languages more conducive for it? Um, the way that the models work, I would say it kind of doesn't make too much of a difference right now. In the sense that like the BERT based models, it's it's just using context very, very well. And in fact, um, there's work that's been shown and I, I cited these in the, in the slides that um, evidence that that BERT is capturing at least some semantic and structural representation too. Like you can, you can get that out of BERT. Uh, so because of that, and if that really, really holds for non-English languages also, then it kind of doesn't matter if it's verb, object, subject, or object, subject, verb. BERT can encode that information um, regardless, at least in theory. Just in case people wanted more, I just want to show some uh, hard examples that are like, yeah, how are we ever going to get things like this? Uh, so-and-so took place or so, I mean, this is a graphic example, I'm sorry, um, but it's like you have issues of like, is one a particular example of something or are you referring to an overarching event? All right, so so-and-so exploded or you know, like, are you talking about a particular terrorist activity or is like a bombing the entire terrorist activity that took place? Um, there are all these nuanced cases that just make it really tricky. All right, thank you, Chris. As usual, excellent presentation. All right, thanks everybody. Thanks. Thanks, Chris.